Good evening. I thank uh, Strelka for hosting us, for arranging cooperation and dialogue on the stage. I hope there will be a dialogue between us and the audience. I congratulate Strelka on the 10th uh, year program. This is a wonderful phenomenon. Uh, for us, uh, for this country. Ten years ago, I started uh, uh, dealing in uh, media art uh, here in Strelka. I took part in the first program, and uh, it was within the Moscow Festival program. The situation has dramatically changed. A lot of time has passed, and the practices uh, that were dealt in uh, ten years ago and uh, called them interaction with new media, they have changed, they have another context. Technologies uh, compared with the 10-year back period have changed, they have become widespread, and that is why the festival project that we are presenting here is, uh, that does not only reflect the ways of communication of people with technologies, with some scientific phenomena and new media, but to the full extent these are projects that uh, are in a certain discourse of innovation, innovational potential, and uh, the way uh, the cultural projects are implemented in the modern innovations uh, connect uh, spheres of art, uh, culture, and I think uh, that it is a very interesting tendency uh, that is developed within uh, festival space. Uh, here on the space, on the stage, I have my colleague with whom I have been working for a long time. We work in different regions. All of one of our Winden is uh, representing the entire a platform connected with modern art that is called Today's Art, and Morris Jones is the artistic director of Mutek GP Festival. It is a big festival, large-scale festival, a large-scale platform that is implementing its initiatives globally in different countries of the world, namely in seven regions. And, uh, uh, we look uh, differently, we uh, are differently connected with the uh, digital culture, but uh, some of our connections are identical, and we would like to present our way of connection. Each of us uh, will speak about festivals that we deal in, will tell you how we build up relations with different communities that are connected with innovations in the modern world, mainly the science and uh, technology. But also I would like to stress uh, that we all, first of all, due to some specific regional aspects, uh, due to uh, different uh, historical uh, perspectives, say, for example, Russia, Netherlands or Japan, we are at different levels of interaction of culture and modern innovations. Uh, for example, uh, today's art has more opportunities uh, to concentrate on innovational forms of uh, today's art and to deal more with the production of new cultural forms. Uh, the Mitek Festival in the Asian um, region is very closely connected with new contexts of digital culture and uh, it is more a global platform uh, that retranslates uh, the uh, actuality of digital culture. As to myself uh, and as to the project uh, that I am co-producing, this is the Gamma F Festival that is held every year in St. Pete. We are focusing more on interdisciplinary communication, and uh, this is uh, very typical of our country, because uh, as uh, compared with other regions, we are 
in uh, on a very early stage of uh, development and uh, for us it is very critical and important to continue translating certain messages and build up a dialogue between different communities for example representatives of culture science and technology then uh, we will um, dwell on each uh, project I think uh, each presentation will take 15 20 minutes we will show some video and after that uh, I will have a couple of questions but I, I would like to give the floor to the audience and I would be happy if you think during our presentations what questions you have and ask them after the presentations are over Yeah, I can start as well. <laughs> but I also need my presentation for that. Okay. Now good, so we start with all of I'll, uh, I'll do it like this. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Olof. I'm very pleased to be back in Moscow. Uh, last time was two years ago. Um, really good memories. Thank you, Gamma Festival, to invite us also, and thank you, Strelka. Um, I'm going to give a presentation about the society we live in right now, the art, and then we discuss a bit further. Uh, I'm director of the Two Days Art Festival in the Netherlands. I am uh, born and raised in West Africa. I moved at the age of 17 to Europe, and I noticed there was a new art form um, arriving, and I got really interested in that. Um, so this talk is about technology, creativity, uh, liberal arts, and this is a famous slide from Steve Jobs in 2009 when he presented this in his keynote, and he said technology alone is not enough. In order to advance our innovation, we need also creativity and liberal arts, so at this cross point, uh, this was the philosophy of, uh, of Steve Jobs. We as humans, we actually, we love technology. Um, we're becoming smarter, we have computers with us all the time, and um, uh, technology is becoming uh, very omnipresent in our life. Why do we love it? It's because it's, we're hyper-connected, like um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we can connect and we can communicate with the rest of the world. We see that there are still a bit of gaps uh, on the right side over there, uh, but the, um, the researchers are saying that in five years from now, 90% of the world population will be connected to the internet, and that's almost three billion people that can communicate constantly. Um, we have unlimited access of information. 25 years ago, internet came, and now we can research everything we want. Um, we're becoming smarter. We have a lot of smart products. Soon our cars will be able to drive themselves uh, and we will be able to maybe print an organ, a new heart, out of a 3D printer. Um, our cities are becoming smarter. And this technology and, and this becoming smarter is actually uh, an accelerating change uh, that is happening for already thousands of years. Uh, and we come to the point that the machines that we created, this technology, uh, is, is becoming almost as smart as humans. In 20, 25 years from now, the machines will have the same capacity as humans. Um, and this acceleration of change is going very rapidly the last 50 years, um, because every knowledge is built on the previous knowledge. Like take the agricultural revolution, it took 5,000 years to develop. After that came the Industrial Revolution. This was just 120 years because it was building on the previous knowledge. Let's take the example of Elon Musk right now. He's pretending that he wants to save the world and that he's the one that will bring us to space. Um, he didn't invent anything. He's just using the knowledge of the space agencies that were for already many, many years researching it. Um, our machines are connected to each other. We already now, in 2019, we have 45 billion of machines that communicate with each other. That gives also endless possibilities. And finally, we have a new citizen. Um, 
a, a new kind of citizen that is not necessarily smarter than us, uh, but that is, let's say, born digital, um, uh, born within this unlimited access of information and uh, born in this unlimited communication. Um, they are not smarter, like I said, but they are used to uh, have this uh, great amounts of information constantly since they are born. They can actually operate an iPad or an iPhone before they can read a book. They use that multitasking and this is um, again not a, a more intelligent human but a, a human that can use his brain differently. Um, and we come to the point that we are almost creating humans that are looking very much the same. Um, this is a, a shot from the movie uh, Ex Machina, um, where actually the, the machine consciousness is being discussed. Um, and when you look at all this machine consciousness and, and AI, we're going to talk about uh, this later on also. Um, I found this image and, and for me this was actually the first way of uh, uh, interaction between machine and human. Uh, this is called the Mechanical Turk. Um, and and the, the guy that you see on top is, is actually a, a machine operated by a man in a box. Um, this technology is beautiful, it connects us, it gives us information, but there is also a downside to it. Um, the downside is related to privacy, uh, look at the way wars are being fought right now, different ethics, uh, nature, uh, the little bastard down there is actually the biggest enemy of human mankind, killed billions of people. We can technically get rid of it, we can manipulate it, that they cannot reproduce or something. But who are we, humans, to edit nature? Uh, can we touch these processes? Can we touch this balance of the ecosystem? And um, uh, the last one, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the George Orwell, 1984, this, this um, um, hyper-mad society that is, that is being controlled. Are we going this way or are we going more to a, m a more free kind of uh, uh, society? Um, who knows who this I is? This is Mark Zuckerberg. Um, um, when he came with Facebook, we all loved it, and now we slowly start to realize that maybe it's an enemy, and, and, and uh, maybe there's criminal activities happening there. Actually, this whole social media is even influencing our democracy. Um, Another, um, this is actually a screenshot from a, a movie. Type it in on, on, on uh, Google and, and, and look at it. It's, it's free on YouTube. Uh, it's called Trust This Computer. And it's, it's really about uh, how technology is influencing our life and how we put, for example, a home pod, a, a smart speaker in our home uh, that um, we think is smart, but it's, it's so smart that it actually tracks your whole life and maybe communicates with a, a server somewhere else. Um, back in the days in, in, in this country you had the KGB, I think this, these home pods are the new KGB that we put ourselves in our home. Um, even democracy, like I said, uh, big data, uh, social media is very much influencing it. We saw it uh, in the United States happening when Trump was elected. We saw it uh, also in the UK when, when Brexit happened. Um, I think there is mass influence of, uh, of, of adv actually the same way that advertising is being used. You're targeted, they know what you like or dislike, and they put you more of this type of information and you get really pissed and you vote on the other side. Um, this one I skipped. So this change is also on, on many levels, like uh, uh, nature is digitalizing. What you see on the left is something that is legal in my country, um, that the, 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 the growing and the smoking of weed. Um, this is actually the same space. A um, couple of years ago they were growing weed and this was the business model. Um, on the other image, in the same space, they replaced the, uh, the plants for uh, computers and they are mining cryptocurrencies. Um, just an example how it's all digitalizing. So actually what I think we're seeing is that there is the biotope and there is the technotope. The biotope is, is the ecosystem, is, is nature that keeps everything balanced. And we as humans, we build our own bio or ecosystem, uh, which we call the, 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 the technotope. Uh, that's the human um, 
um, ecosystem. So when we started billions of years ago, the planet was just a lonely rock in space. Um, and then there came a geosphere, and the geosphere gave us oxygen so there could be life on the planet. And it took billions of years to develop, and then came the humans, and they created their own technosphere on top of it. And actually, all these three images, I show them next to each other because um, the last one, the technosphere, is trying to find this balance with nature, uh, but it's feeding on the biosphere. Think of the resources that we take out of the soil, like oil and, and these kind of things. Um, and this will come to an end. At some point, the resources are, are limited and, and we maybe run out of some things. So I think we are in a very important point in history um, to define how we can bring these two things in balance, the ecosystem and the technosphere because we don't want this as a result. And when we look at the world, um, uh, there's a lot of things that we don't see. The ocean, for example, is quite empty. And, and we're all talking about climate change, that we produce too much CO2. Uh, but at the same time, CO2 is needed to feed the trees. The tree needs CO2 to live. Um, I think the problem is, it's not the emission of CO2, but we just cut all the trees and we disbalance the ecosystem of the ocean, so the plankton is dying and plankton is also giving oxygen. So we need to change. Um, and I suggest um, a model that goes from vertical to horizontal. Like the previous world, let's say the past 50 years after the Second World War, uh, is in my opinion very vertical. It's based on, on profit and on capitalism and on branding and on ego. Um, and if you think of a vertical structure, it has an end. It, it starts to either underneath or above. Uh, and I think we are reaching this point. And if we can slam it down to a horizontal model, which is way more stable, which is endless, and which is more about sharing and collaborating and, and using all these resources and maybe at some point even we have more free time because the machine is taking it over. What are we going to do with it? Um, so vertical is collapsing and horizontal is endless. Um, and then our greatest values. Um, I think most of the world thinking in economical terms or in science, how can we move forward? Um, I think it, the, the, the biggest values is, is science and culture together and, and not to boost economy again, but to boost human evolution. Um, so creativity and consciousness and let's go I don't have sound but um, this is a small uh, film fragment of, uh, of Star Wars where they are actually uh, Star Trek sorry where they're doing um, uh, projecting a world that is actually the opposite of, of George Orwell it's a, it's a future world and uh, they're talking now about a, a world where the concept of money doesn't exist anymore. Uh, because w they don't work to better our own life, but they work to better society. So our culture is digital. Um, uh, we all know this. It's, it's contemporary. We are, it's very diverse. Um, and um, we have to live with it. Um, we talked a bit about society, technology. Now I would like to go a bit more into art and creativity. Um, because the rapid changes in the world and in society um, is also happening in the arts. Uh, technology is something that artists are really interested in. Uh, the computer became the meta medium. Um, uh, and, and you see more and more the traditional art consumption is also changing. But at the end, the medium doesn't really matter, I think. It's, it's what art does, and it's the message of it. It doesn't matter if it's painted or with code or with uh, uh, machine intelligence. Uh, it's what art does. Um, this is uh, the more traditional way of consuming art. Uh, in a museum where things are well collected um, and, and quite one-dimensional, I see a, a completely new form of art coming that's way more immersive. Uh, there is a big piece of, of uh, Ryoji Ikeda here uh, and, and kimchi and chips. They are projecting on parabolic mirrors and, and, and smoke, so they create actually an image that's floating. Uh, Iris van Herpe, a Dutch fashion designer, she works with, with very special material and, and uh, the latest technologies of uh, 3D printing. 
uh, or Boyan Slot, very young guy. At the age of 18, he was studying at the Technical University in, in Delft, Netherlands. And uh, he saw that the ocean was, was dirty and he said, I have a plan, I want to clean it. And um, I put him in here because I, I want to show also that, that um, you know, his age, he was 18 when he came with this idea and he's now running a company with more than 200 people working and they are testing. Um, I think an old guy of 55 years old would never had the guts to do this anymore. And, and a young person uh, um, with access to communication and who is connected has the possibility to do something as big as this. Um, this is uh, uh, called uh, the autonomous lockup. Uh, also, an, uh, I think a very strong artistic reaction um, on the uh, uh, self-driving cars, for example. This is uh, uh, the artist is James Bridal. Um, he looked at this whole concept of autonomous cars and there's a lot of discussion, also ethical discussion. And he made a very simple work. He put uh, salt lines around the car uh, and, and the car thinks it's parked and, and is locked and cannot go anywhere because it's actually not so smart. Um, Daan Roosgaarde, a designer from the Netherlands, he um, is working on, on smart highways, but also a project that he tested in, in uh, China and in the Netherlands. It's a big vacuum cleaner that is sucking up the CO2 out of the air. He collects the dust and under high pressure he creates new uh, valuable materials like diamonds and creates jewelry out of it. So he, he upscales actually the dirt that we produce. Um, here are some other examples of, of different type of art. Um, this is for example a musical instrument. Um, uh, tennis balls that are shot with 200 kilometers per hour on a wooden box and this creates a rhythm. Um, here I think you can really see that artists are looking for a new way of expressing themselves uh, beyond even the computer that came 20 years ago. Um, Evelina Domnic, uh, a project where she is levitating water um, uh, based on sound, with sound frequencies. Um, here is a, a duo from Serbia, they're called LP Duo. We did a project with them, uh, it's called Quantum Music. We collaborated with the University of Oxford with quantum physics musicians, uh, uh, professors. Um, and we created a new musical instrument trying to define the sound of quantum atoms. Uh, still in progress because it's very complicated. Quantum physics uh, and entanglement is, uh, is very complicated uh, uh, material to, uh, to work in the arts. Or the public space. Um, we all know the, the projection mapping on, on buildings. Uh, this was done in 2008 or something. We had a big project in the public space. We built, we, we, we made the whole city as an airport. Um, and in the middle of the city there was a landing strip of 400 meters long with uh, a sound system of 128 speakers facing the wall. So it created a real Doppler effect. Uh, Doppler effect is what you have when sound is um, uh, added onto each other that you cannot define anything anymore. That's when, when a very no a loud noise, like an airplane for example. Uh, massive uh, piece in the public space. Uh, or artists that are now um, uh, working with, with um, this is a, a project called Hatsune Miku. Um, it's uh, um, uh, hologram projections, so also a new kind of technology that's being used. Uh, Rafael Lozano Hemmer, um, one of the greatest media artists right now. Um, also working with a lot of technology, but very much reflecting on, on the societal uh, questions that we have. Like for, he's known for very large artworks in the public space where he's using these skylights. Um, and, and when we look at it, we think, wow, it's very aesthetic, but actually he's these lights are, are made for military purposes. And he's using this military purpose tools to create art with it. Um, Lisa Park, working a lot with neurofeedback. This is an installation that she developed together with Marina Abramovic in New York. Um, it's an installation that she's controlling with her brain activity, with, with sensors. Um, and uh, when she's, she's controlling the sound, and you're looking actually at speakers, and on the speakers is water. 
So the sound is, is visualized by the, by the sound. So her, her brain is feeding the sound and the sound is visualizing the image. I, I found this a very beautiful piece. Um, or the uh, project Cell F by Guy Ben-Ari. Uh, Natalia will speak uh, about this project a little bit later. Um, but a uh, very innovative project where uh, this artist is using human brain cells or human cells modified uh, and, and he made a musical instrument uh, out of it. Um, Gideon Hobijn, Staalplaat uh, from uh, Berlin. Uh, he made these uh, musical instruments with old oil pipes. Uh, it's an organ uh, and with fire in this different length of pipe he could create different types of tones. Um, I think also quite projects that you would not see necessarily in museums, uh, but that you see that artists are interested in, in, in entering this public space. Um, drops it continues actually what you're looking at here is a is a musical composition a rhythmic composition made with explosives and a huge computer system that is triggering um, this uh, these explosions uh, so not a traditional music instruments but uh, this artist used explosives to uh, to make his music uh, and then artificial intelligence uh, we see it more and more coming up uh, a lot of artists are experimenting with it uh, this is CA uh, Hyper Hologram from Istanbul. Um, this is another project from uh, Refik Anadol. Uh, it's called Melting Memories. He's using uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence in this project and he's um, uh, collecting huge amounts of data uh, and he's making this project is, is about machine hallucination. So he's going a step further with this AI into creating uh, very aesthetic forms. or Daito Manabe from Japan. What Daito is doing in his piece, he's actually using artificial intelligence live on stage. Uh, it's, it's all the, 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 the dancers are continuously interacting with this projected technology. And you can really see that during this one hour piece that the technology is becoming smarter. It starts with very clumsy movement that is following the dancer. And at the end, you cannot even see the difference between the human and, and the projection. Um, so this is our context. Um, the world is changing, society is changing, um, the natural resources are under threats. Uh, education, I think there's a big problem in education. We still work in a hundred year old model where we teach the kids um, to, to, to memorize things. I started one of the first slides was this unlimited amount of information. Information is there, it's more about interpreting this information. Uh, or trying to find the talent in the children, like where is their creativity? Um, we don't need to uh, educate them to become lawyer or banker or these kind of things because these jobs might not exist anymore. At the same time, it's getting darker. We see the right-wing governments uh, uh, coming up everywhere and we seriously need solutions. So again, beware of the artists and beware of creativity. And in all these new questions that we need to answer, like the driving car, where is the responsibility? We need artists, I think, and philosophers uh, to discuss these matters. 
um, net art came, the same articles started to come up, like, uh, is this art? And, and uh, uh, um, there's still a long way to go. And, and of course, AI is, is not perfect yet, and all these new tools, but I think artists should be nerding more and more and continue to, to because this is a, a new tool. And like I said before, I personally don't really care about the tool. It's more the message and, and what art does. I would like to uh, leave. Uh, happening annually in Tokyo. And obviously, I'm not Japanese, <laughs> as you can probably tell. But I've been living in Japan um, for, for seven years now and uh, been, been working for this festival, among other things. And um, being in Japan is basically an, an expression of my, um, my general kind of curiosity to, to explore new geographies. Uh, explore new countries, explore new cultures, and especially with the festival now, how to how to support n peripheral geographies to kind of come to 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 the main mainstream or to get more attention, and that's uh, what I'm going to talk about uh, today in a little bit. But before that, I want to give you a little bit more context about uh, what we're doing with the festival in Japan. Um, I'm going to show a quick video, um, which has a lot of nice images. To, to get into the new geographies, I think it's very important to, to tell you a little bit more about, um, like about Mutech Japan and Mutech in general. So um, probably a lot of you people know about Mutech. It's been founded 20 years ago in Montreal and um, has expanded to now seven cities, uh, including Tokyo, but also other places like Mexico City and Buenos Aires. Um, which I think is very important when we think about the whole idea of ex like um, discovering new geographies. And the, the important thing about the Mutech idea in that sense is that it was never the plan for the people in Montreal to go out and uh, do festivals somewhere else. Like it's not a franchise, it's not ultra or something that just want to go out and make money. But it was actually the, the, the opposite. It was that uh, they invited people from other countries to come or people from other countries just came to Montreal and they saw what was happening and they loved the concept and they wanted to bring this concept to, to their cities. Originally Mexico and then Barcelona and then um, all the other cities. And the same happened with us in Japan as well. Uh, four to five years ago, we saw that there was uh, something missing in our city. And uh, you might think it's crazy because Tokyo is like very technological and very advanced, but there was really no platform for this kind of creativity, but um, on, a, on, a, on a larger scale to bring people together to discuss these kind of um, ideas. And um, the idea is to that, that Mutech has always been mediating between this um, hyper-local in the in the global context, and that's what is very uh, important. Um, we're going to skip this. Um, I quickly want to uh, impress you with amazing numbers for our festival because that's what I came here to do to brag about how amazing Mutech Japan is. Um, we've been um, so we started in 2016 uh, with a two and a half day festival. We had 1,800 visitors, and we're able to grow it in the last three years to uh, 8,000 people over four days with like an extensive program. Uh, you see we had more artists from different countries. Um, that's all good. 
another amazing slide how many people we have. The next slide is what I want to talk about today and what I think is um, the, the interesting or what, which struck me um, quite recently and um, which is um, playing into a lot of efforts that we're involved in now. And that's uh, the demographics of uh, how our festival developed. So in the first year, like almost 99% of our audience was uh, Japanese people. Um, it was the first time we, w we did it small scale, so that makes a lot of sense. Um, but already then, uh, I was really struck that uh, there I met one guy who came all the way from Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia to our festival. And uh, it was happening for the first time, and I was like, uh, I was really struck that someone would come there because Kuala Lumpur is Asia, and it might sound that it's close, but it's still a seven hour flight from Kuala Lumpur to Tokyo, which is just like an hour and a half shorter than coming from Tokyo all the way uh, to Moscow. So it's quite a distance. But, um, but it, I didn't really think about it that much at that time. I was quite surprised. I was happy that someone would come. Um, but then something started happening over the last two years that um, we saw an increasing amount of people from, from the region coming to, to travel to the festival. Um, last year it was uh, 4% uh, from, from the greater Asian region, um, which doesn't sound like much, but if, it's like, if you consider it's 8,000 people, 4% is like 350 people, which I think is actually an incredible uh, amount, and I was like very happy. Um, to see that because you also have to understand that uh, it's not like Europe, like people, like the difference between the wealth and the countries is very different. It's like a lot of effort from someone from the Philippines to fly to Japan, like a lot more than someone from France driving to Germany and attending a festival there. So um, we felt that we, that there was increased attention within the region that, uh, that there's something happening that is catering to like a specific kind of need that might not be happening in other countries. Uh, in the region, and that's why people are coming to or looking up a little bit to what we're doing in Japan. Um, but we also felt that like there's some kind of uh, responsibility that comes with with this attention and kind of fulfilling a, a certain role, but at the same time not uh, having like this kind of cocky attitude that like uh, yeah in Japan we know how to do things. Um, so we're really thinking about how to work with that. And um, this development is not really isolated. It's, um, it's also an external development within the region. So we've been seeing over the last uh, few years that there's increasing creative outbursts in countries like Korea, uh, where there's like new venues, there's new collectives. In Taiwan, there's like uh, new festivals, people doing things, working with like the technology that they're giving. The more affordable it gets, the more people get involved with that. And um, so I was talking to uh, a representative from the Japan Foundation, which is like a big government body that provides a lot of funding for shows like Daito Manabe, for example, that went to Today's Art. Um, and they're also a lot involved in, in, in Asia. And um, our contact there said, the Maurice, you need to understand that actually in every country there's a rhizomatics now. Like in every Asian country, there are collectives that are working this and they're actually taking it to 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 another level they not just make an art but actually they have the ability to commercialize what they do and make make their living with that which is um uh, quite interesting to see how the the affordability of digital technology the access to the internet is actually empowering these local communities to 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 move forward so the question now was how how, wh wh what are we going to do with all this information? Like people are coming to Japan, there's like rhizomatics everywhere. Um, how can we how can we work with that? And we felt that there's like kind of a momentum that we want to use, and um, we are working on a, a initiative. It's the working title right now: Digital Creative Asia, which is um, basically um, moving towards creating a, a, a network of digital culture in Asia and bringing the people. Um, closer together and fostering understanding because even though um, like Olaf showed on his slide like we're all super connected but are we really so that's something that I really uh, felt talking also with the communities there and that there there is like a visible connection because we can get information from like the other side of the world but that's that really mean we're connected to to the people that are there and that's something um, that I think is, is very important to kind of keep in mind the other reason to, um, for us to, to work on establishing this kind of network is because it is a peripheral network. We kind of want to circumvent the, 
the often still Western-centric kind of uh, point of view, um, which I also think is uh, quite important to, to keep in mind. And uh, in the end, we want to create opportunities for, for people that are on the periphery that might be underrepresented that have uh, increasing opportunities to digital culture. And we kind of think about how we can channel the potential that is there in a way that um, it's not a vertical approach, it's a horizontal approach by sharing like the knowledge and sharing uh, simple things like access to funding that we have in Japan that might not be available in other countries in the region. So the problem right now is that um, even though we're all super connected, um, the, the, there are some networks, there's people-to-people uh, -people exchange, like I know a guy in Korea and he invites me to play at his festival, or like uh, I know this museum in Singapore and I can bring my friend to do his installation there. But it's nothing that is really formalized. I think there's a lot of like money and resources and also like talent and creativity getting wasted by, by missing a kind of uh, formal approach. And the, the problem because that there is no formal approach um, existing right now is that in the end, it's still very fragmented. We're not as connected as we think we are, especially when it comes to peripheral countries. People have less money. Uh, if we think about the Asian region, it's uh, quite fragmented. Uh, the ge geography, like I was saying, Kuala Lumpur is an eight-hour flight from Tokyo, so it's not easy to go there. Um, there are no low-cost carriers on the scale that we have in Europe where you can go like to a party weekend uh, in Barcelona for like 10 years or something. The other problem, especially in Asia, is that politically it's very fragmented. Uh, like Chinese system is very different from the system in Singapore, it's very different from like the democracy in the Philippines. Uh, to like the weird status that Taiwan has, being a country but not being a country. Um, also culturally it's very uh, very diverse with uh, different religions, different uh, attitudes there, and then language-wise. So there's a lot of barriers in that way, and it's also on the people basis, like the scenes themselves are still very fragmented, so you can't really say that uh, there's like an Indonesian, there, there is an Indonesian scene, but the scene itself is like there's some communities in Jakarta doing something, some communities in Jakarta doing something, so the, the communities in themselves are maybe not as connected as they, they might seem. And um, there's also the, the lack of information and communication from some of those communities. So like, it's really hard for me to find some information of what is going on in, in certain countries because there's, um, on one hand, there are like, sometimes trust issues that uh, people don't want to communicate or they're like, wary of outsiders because they have been like, abused before. In, in some ways, but there's also in some countries the fear of repercussions. If people are too openly talking about their art and what they do and their concepts behind it, they might face repercussions from, from the government, I don't know, from reli religious leaders. It really depends on the country. It's very diverse there. And finally, as I was mentioning before, there's the big problem of uh, funding and um, also the disparity between the different countries. Singapore is very rich. Uh, Philippines is not so rich, uh, Cambodia is not rich at all, and Laos is probably the poorest from all of them. So how, how, can, we, how can we deal with that? Um, and um, I would say there are two approaches for us as a festival. Um, so I would like to call them the internal approach, what we can do as, as a festival, and the external approach, what is, can be done beyond the festival. So as a festival, um, being in Japan, um, we have a very unique position because there is like a developed scene. Uh, the political culture is very uh, stable. Uh, people love Japan. There's actually a lot of money on getting like inbound visitors to Japan. Um, a lot of money for the arts. So it's very, very unique position that uh, I don't think any other country in, in Asia has. So um, like our idea as a festival is to, to share that access that we have uh, with the communities in Southeast Asia. So for this year, uh, our festival is happening in December. We're planning to have a, a big showcase of uh, East Asian and Southeast Asian artists, um, but also having a discourse program that kind of initiates a discussion um, by bringing all the people together in one spot to, to um, discuss with the communities what, what is it you want, what are your fears, how can we um, um, help, how can we share, how can we do things together, how can we connect basically more closely to each other. 
And in the end, um, we want to generate future opportunities by doing that. This is not going to be like a one-time showcase and then it's like, okay, this is enough help and now you're on your own, but actually we want to generate opportunities. It can be very simple, like having an exchange residency be between Southeast Asia or Japan, but it can also be like bigger things in the future. And beyond the festival, um, we want to really create this network. It's, uh, it's a very long way because it's, um, we're in the research phase right now. We're um, developing trust with the, with the right people, trying to find the right partners in the different countries. Um, but eventually, I, I, we, have, we got inspiration from what is happening in Europe. You have like um, festival networks like We Are Europe, you have the Shape Platform, which is really much about like supporting emerging artists and um, doing showcases. There's going to be a big Shape Showcase at Gamma Festival this year um, in July. And um, that might be like um, the, the biggest goal that is there out there, um, to kind of try to get the right people together that are willing to, to put their money and sweat in it to, to create a more formal network in order to just channel all the things, all the resources, all the artists, all the cre creativity that is in the region that is like swirling around um, but maybe goes to waste because there's no, no formal entity that kind of looks at everything uh, and brings it together in uh, an effective way. So that's kind of the, the goal that we have um, by doing that. and. Um, that's it. <laughs> thank you. So, uh, so thank you. <laughs> These are like uh, uh, different views on the cultural landscapes, which are technologically driven by uh, uh, by our colleagues. And I would uh, like to get back to the uh, Russian situation and the cultural landscape in Russia with uh, the case of Gamma Festival. Uh, which I'm uh, co-producing with uh, the whole team at the moment. And uh, we are the youngest uh, platform for uh, cultural initiatives for innovation in Russia. And uh, actually, uh, for me, as for a curator, this is uh, pretty... Uh, inspiring that uh, like five years ago uh, working in the uh, institution uh, and state federal institution I couldn't uh, imagine that uh, such a platform would exist uh, in our country and uh, after five years uh, the fact that this uh, particular uh, structure of uh, the cultural initiative existing for social innovation is existing is very uh, important. So um, I would say that uh, the festival is the youngest uh, comparing to the other two presented here and uh, we uh, will have just the fourth edition this year. Uh, but uh, I would say that uh, the whole uh, team that is working for the festival also already acquired quite a huge uh, experience uh, dealing with uh, new media, with the technology and, and basically on the intersection of art, science and technology in the country for uh, like many years already. And the festival, of course, uh, started with the music. And uh, this is also what we were like discussing in the very beginning uh, when we were like uh, having coffee before the talk, that uh, we shouldn't uh, forget that uh, the thing about uh, being united by the club culture and the electronic music that used to be uh, one of the uh, actually mediator for the technology and science in different fields is very important for us. So uh, despite the fact uh, we uh, are as a platform uh, introduce uh, our audience to the new uh, ideas about technology and science in the contemporary society of course we have like the very solid basi basis what is uh, electronic music and uh, visual art so I would like to show you our post movie of the last year and then continue a little bit with the structure of the platform just did a Facebook post with a nice photo. Everybody's always asking, ah, Berlin, what is it all about this city? And it will finish soon, so what is the new Berlin? And I thought, like, today, St. Petersburg could be the new Berlin. 
the first thing what really uh, strikes me in St. Petersburg, I think St. Petersburg is more the cultural capital. The architecture, those bridges everywhere, people kissing on the bridge, and like the, the sun was shining. I had so much different concepts in my head about the country, and now, uh, you know, it's shifting. It cannot be otherwise. You cannot be not impressed by St. Petersburg, actually. You see a perfect mix between European culture and also Russian culture. Very positive. Super positive. What does it mean, art? Art is what makes us humans different than animals. Multidisciplinarity, like having music, having visual arts, having installations. This is the art of now. Artists are very important kind of people in our society because they help us engage with ideas and the world around us in ways that we don't realize and we don't see. There's a lot of things you can talk about about music, where you can do business, but you can do creative. And that's, I think, also the role of a festival, is you, in a short time, you give out a lot of energy, you, com you push a lot of program together. In that case, Gamma is doing a really logical concept. They want to establish something like a community in Russia. First thing is good technique. They have a focus, they have an idea, a concept. Everything looks really professional, so perfect. This is something I appreciate much more than just a standard festival. A festival where everything comes together as a community. You should go through all the states, all the different components. The space, the venue, the place itself has a soul of its own. You get to talk, you get to educate, you get to maybe open up people's ideas of what the music is, what the culture is. for example, people that are interested in techno music to suddenly realize that Rachmaninoff maybe is not so far away from techno music. It looks like a really good space for uh, people to have creative freedom. But with Gamma, I have also the feeling that the people are really lift music, you know? It's not, it's not, it's not at all about like uh, making this festival to make money or to get famous or to get connections or to push their careers just lovers, they're, they're lovers of art and music. I think Russians are very, very great creators. But people are really enthusiastic at this festival. A festival where you can exchange with the public, where you, where you can make new friends and uh, where you fall in love with the organizers because they give so much hard blood into it. Plus a very good sound system and a huge crowd with lots of energy, so you can't ask for more than this. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, the mission we have uh, for the festival, uh, as I uh, was telling before, that we are all uh, at the moment in 
our projects uh, are about communications and uh, this is what we do in a different levels like we uh, communicate our ideas and basically we created this uh, platform the festival platform to communicate the idea of change uh, through the culture through the technology through the science uh, to the whole society and then uh, what we do in order to uh, unite uh, people uh, through the festival is uh, we created the uh, um, professional platform, professional program um, at the festival and the name of this program is Gamma Pro. Basically this is the conference, uh, the interdisciplinary conference uh, on art, uh, technology and science, what we run since uh, last year. And uh, this uh, project is uh, specifically helping us to establish international uh, dialogue and uh, intercultural communication, uh, organize the support for international communication uh, for us. And uh, in this project, we uh, used to work uh, closely with uh, uh, many uh, different embassies and cultural centers. Uh, that help us to invite uh, international participants for this uh, program and uh, to talk about uh, innovation, about uh, technologies, about scientific progress and in what relation it is existing in the moment towards uh, culture and uh, contemporary art, of course. And uh, um, this uh, particular part of the project uh, um, helped us uh, to establish quite a strong relationship at the moment to uh, several uh, like European institutions and uh, due to some specific communication towards that we will have the uh, showcase of the SHAPE network this year. For those who don't know um, and who um, is not aware of uh, what's going on and what are the news of the festival, I would um, additionally say that this is a huge network which is very interesting to have a look at of uh, 14 uh, European festivals that uh, do throughout the year like enormous curatorial work actually research on new names in art and music and then um, with the help of uh, Creative Europe program um, showcase uh, new artists mostly with a debut uh, in different countries uh, like uh, this year it will be happening in St. Petersburg so we uh, actually create the opportunity for all the people in Russia to see uh, brand new names uh, like what you uh, would maybe uh, miss if this program would uh, not exist. Uh, then um of course, uh, part of the mission is to create, and for this purpose, we have the whole Gamma Lab uh, now, what is the experimental project uh, in the festival, and uh, this is particular uh, a kind of a hub, um, creative hub for us, where we uh, research uh, the relationship between uh, new technologies, and um, for this year, for instance, we uh, um, took uh, artificial intelligence as the main focus, and uh, as this technology in particular is so much like hyped and uh, everyone wants to talk about it, it was very interesting for us to uh, work with it uh, not in the level of like popularization of this technology because there is so much uh, what already have done, uh, have been done, but uh, we um, invited uh, several artists to work uh, on a very different application of machine learning, machine vision, and actually to think of the ideas of the general artificial intelligence, what is mainly considered uh, still as a uh, approach uh, mostly on the level of philosophy and uh, uh, very theoretical uh, discussion. Um, what is interesting for uh, me as for curator of this, this project is that uh, we were, like, I'd say very brave with launching this lab as an international project because everyone knows and usually you say that for international collaboration it's very difficult to run such things in Russia due to many problems like visa regulations, people from some countries uh, don't really want to um, uh, like invest a lot into uh, traveling in participate in such initiatives here, but we, uh, we were very lucky and the experience for us is that uh, we had uh, very strong, interesting and um, artists with 
actually very high uh, qualification from such countries as uh, United States or Kenya or Slovakia that joined uh, the lab and were elaborating projects with us. So uh, this uh, lab, um, and uh, um, you see here also the photo of Dimitri Morozov, who is one of the most productive uh, media artists in Russia at the moment, and uh, you rarely see him actually here, but more in the other countries. And this is what we uh, continue to do in the next year, and also uh, at the lab as a platform, so give the opportunities for um, artists in Russia to collaborate with international artists and uh, help to communicate people their ideas and collaborate together and show this at the festival. And uh, then uh, the last um, uh, point of uh, the mission is to inspire, of course, and uh, here we say that um, we um, work with people always and despite the uh, idea of uh, working with the technology and science on a very like um, high level, um, we uh, always think that there are people that are joining our projects and actually what they take for themselves sometimes is very uh, different from um, technological or like scientific expertise. Uh, for instance, uh, if to uh, talk about the lab, uh, people uh, come there and uh, there is an international group and people uh, often um, kind of train their communication skills also because for artists it's also become very crucial to uh, talk to each other and to have the space for simple communication and to uh, be free to express and to actually get the inspiration. And as soon as uh, for the festival we have several projects throughout the year, like uh, the lab for instance or some other appearances that we have and the other uh, um, platforms and uh, like public programs, uh, sometimes we even uh, don't know how far the, the inspiration uh, for the people that we help to gain actually is going. And uh, this is actually very interesting to uh, see and research uh, how far does it go and how much people take from the festival and what, ki what kind of uh, an influence at the end we are having working so hard on this intersection of art, uh, science and technology. And I'd also like to show you some figures like uh, the numbers uh, because uh, um, I mean, the festival is quite huge, right? And uh, at the moment, uh, in 2018, we have uh, uh, 10,000 people that visited the festival, and uh, every year uh, the amount of people is growing. And I would say that this is not because of like our own t growing uh, possibilities, um, but uh, this is because uh, of overall um, growing interest to the question of the uh, innovation in culture and uh, what kind of an influence it has for the society. And um, I would like to here uh, st uh, stop my talk, but show you uh, a little video about the project, what we kind of all uh, see as one of the most avant-garde at the moment. And uh, this would be kind of a teaser for Gamma Festival this year. Uh, and um, then uh, we will have some questions. Yeah. Self is the world's first neural synthesizer. It is an autonomous instrument that is composed of a brain made of biological neural networks and a body made of analog modular synthesizers that work in synergy. The neural networks are bioengineered from the project's initiator, Guy Benari's cells. There is no programming or computers involved, only biological matter and analog circuits. A wetalog instrument. With self, the musician and musical instrument become one entity to create a cybernetic musician, a rock star in a petri dish. Self premiered in a live set with Tokyo based drummer Darren Moore. The sound of the drums was fed as electric stimulations into Self's neural network, 
and Self responded by controlling the synthesizers in an improvised post-human sound piece. During the performance, there was a clear sense of communication and responsiveness between the human and the non-human musicians. The origin of the project can be traced back to Benari's adolescent dream to become a rock star. This long-standing passion for music, combined with 16 years of research exploring artistic embodiment of bioengineered brains, laid the foundation for creating the cybernetic self-portrait. Like David Bowie creating Ziggy Stardust, Benari created self as his rock star alter ego. Self is the result of a collaborative effort involving artists, engineers, and scientists. It posed enormous technical challenges, and each one of the project members played an important role in shaping the final outcome. The first step was to harvest skin cells from Benari's arm via biopsy and cultivating them in the lab. Then, using induced pluripotent stem cell technology, Benari transformed his skin cells into stem cells. Then, he differentiated the stem cells into functional neural networks and grew them over a multi-electrode array dish to become Benari's external brain. These neural networks contain approximately 100,000 cells. Human brains contain approximately 100 billion cells. The brain used to control self is essentially a symbolic one, but still produces tremendous amounts of data, responds to stimuli, exhibits properties of plasticity, and is subject to a lifespan. The MEA dishes that host Benari's external brain consist of a grid of 8x8 eight eight electrodes. These can record the electric signals that the neurons produce and send stimulations to the neurons, essentially a read and write interface to the brain. Human musicians are invited to play with self in special one-off shows. The human music is fed to the neurons as stimulations, and the neurons respond by controlling the synthesizers. Together, they perform live, reflexive, and improvised sound pieces that are not entirely human. Self sonifies the activity of the neurons in an engaging way while maintaining its integrity. It reflects the complex nature and the spatialized aspects of the neural activity. During the performance, the sound is spatialized to 16 speakers to reflect the pockets of activity within the Petri dish. Walking around the performance space offers the sensation of walking through Benari's external brain. Self's sculptural object is a self-contained unit that incorporates the modular synthesizers and analog interfaces with a fully equipped, custom-made biological laboratory. The object was designed to allow for the complex biological protocols and the maintenance of neuronal cultures in field conditions, as well as being a functional performative instrument. We aim to continue exhibiting self and to take it on the road as a rock star should. We plan to collaborate with other musicians and various musical ensembles, and we wonder how different musical styles might influence self's functional plasticity or ability to play. Self addresses our interest in problematizing biotechnologies and contextualizing them within an artistic framework. It started with a new materialist question underpinned by the belief that artistic practice can act as a vector for thought. What is the potential for artworks using biological technologies to evoke responses in regards to the shifting perceptions surrounding the understanding of life and the materiality of the human body. Thank you. 
So uh, this video is uh, um, like underlining also and questioning maybe the answer how much far we are in our relationship uh, between uh, science, uh, technology and art uh, because this is a perfect example of uh, uh, truly futuristic art uh, which is happening uh, not in the gallery space, but in the uh, space of the uh, lab, but uh, then uh, where can it be exhibited and where can it be shown and perceived by the audience, of course, is just the uh, festival environment, uh, because even the uh, traditional museum environment wouldn't uh, allow and have uh, so many restrictions for that. Uh, so um, I would uh, go now with a couple of questions, like uh, my question to Olof, uh, would be um, how actually you um, uh, research the new tendencies in contemporary culture uh, and uh, how uh, do you evaluate uh, what we would be like the most interesting and the most innovative uh, thing for you to show in the festival or in the other uh, projects you are running? Um, I, d I don't think we research a lot. Um, and certainly not in an academic way. Um, I think it's it's more we feel a tendency in this in this international ecosystem. Uh, we see new developments of arts. Actually, that that's how the reason why we started today's art was that we saw this new art form coming that the traditional institutions were not uh, understanding yet, and and still today the performer is in the theater and the visual artist is, is in the museum. Uh, this new art form, is, is there's a lot of crossover. It's sound, it's image, it's technology. It's, it's, uh, and we saw that it, it was easier to present in galleries or in festivals and, and there was a need for these kind of platforms. It's a feeling. Uh, and I would never say, okay, there's a new technology, let's focus on this new technology because I think then we get very one-dimensional. That's what I showed also in my presentation. There are some pieces completely analog. Uh, and again, it's, it's not the medium, it's, it's what is being showed. Um, and, and um, you know, if, if a famous artist, uh, Michelangelo or, or Van Gogh, think of them living now, they would probably not paint, they would use this new, new tool. Um, so to your question, no, no research, just uh, being part of this ecosystem in a lot of partnerships, uh, with the Shape Network in Europe, but also internationally with, with festivals like Mutech. And then we, we see what's happening and a very close relationship with the artists also. We see what they are developing and then we're like, hey, fuck, maybe we can give you a platform in our festival to, to do a tryout. Um, yeah, it's, it's a go with the flow and, and, um, and we don't want to necessarily present the next thing. We're not tomorrow's art, we're, we're today's art. Um, so it's, it's still, we, with this we want to trigger an emotion in people and, and the gathering of people, like the social context, much more than being very cutting edge in the science or in the technology. Thank you. Maurice, how about you? And the uh, question would be also um, next to this one, uh, is that um, like uh, the, um, there are many festivals of Mutech which are happening around the world. So uh, definitely you are bringing a lot of international art to Japan. And uh, how much uh, do you have to actually adapt uh, this to like local situation and to the, um, I don't know, some specific regional um, ideas of how to perceive art and how, how, how much difficult that is for Japanese audience? Um, that's, a, that's a very interesting question. So I think what is beautiful about the, the Mutec network as a whole is that um, because it's, it's, like I was saying before, it's all basically homegrown initiatives that just took a concept that was, um, that was something they found interesting, um, but they adapted it to, to their own environments and that includes also, of course we bring international artists, but we're also very much conscious of the, of the local environment. Uh, that we have and there was never the push to do it in a certain way from like there was not the headquarters saying you have to do it this way or that way but actually there's so much trust between the different cities and the headquarters that they can develop it in a way that is really relevant to their um, local 
environment and that also goes in like um, both directions from now on so um, it really like like Olaf was saying it's very important for us to have um, the context for things so if if there should be a showcase of a lot of Canadian artists because it's a Canadian festival. That's not really the case. We really always have the freedom to, to think about what makes most sense for us. But now, after four years, or like the fourth year doing it, we also are in a position where we're like not the little brother anymore, but we're like in a, in a level where we're more equal to the other music festivals. And um, now we're also starting to push like our, our topics and things that are interesting for us, like if, if it's simple, like we're gonna have a big showcase of Japanese artists in Mutec Montreal this year, because uh, we as like the, the, the festival in Asia are feeling like there's not enough Asian artists in this festival. So please bring Japanese artists for now, and then in the future, especially with developing these new geographies, bring more Asian artists as well. And um, it was also the kind of responsibility that I was talking about that I feel that we have being this kind of outlet of a big network in, in, in Asia to kind of um, take the responsibility and also take the, the task to communicate these kind of uh, things to, to like the bigger environment. And uh, it's also not only the Mutech network, um, like I'm very happy that for Gamma, for example, this year we're going to have like a collaboration between Gamma Festival and uh, uh, Mutech Japan with like a Japanese artist being part of the opening performance. And these are also these kind of networks that I was talking about uh, that I think are very important to build. Uh, and uh, it's only growing and that's really beautiful to see. Thank you. I, um, я думаю, что я видела вот там, по-моему, рука была с вопросом. Есть ли у кого-то вопросы? Are there any questions uh, in the audience to our speakers or to me? You are welcome. Uh, Larissa? Larissa? We have a question here. Hey. Uh, yeah, it's working. <laughs> nice. Uh, hi, guys. Yeah, I would like to say thank you so much for your presentation. It was very enlightening and so provoking just crazy. Uh, I think I really like the part with uh, Japanese festival and just want to spend all of my money <laughs> on a ticket to Japan. Yeah, so my question, maybe kind of personal to you, how do you think, what's your biggest inspiration in your career, at your work? Uh, maybe you like have maybe a mission, your personal mission kind of connected with the uh, general movement. Um, yeah, so what, what drives you the most? For me? Uh, yeah. For all of like us. For, you, for all of you guys. Mm, I don't know. I draw my biggest inspiration from, from the people around me, I think. Um, I'm, I'm still quite young, I would say, compared to uh, Olaf, who has been doing it for a long time. Um, but it's these kind of people that, like, um, that really like, give me inspiration to, to, to like, move things forward and like, never stop um, with anything and never stop asking questions and never like, pushing uh, things forward. Like, another big inspiration is the head of Mutech, Alain Mojon, who taught me a lot. Um, and yeah, it's really the people, people around me, but also the interaction with the artists. It's like all of that kind of combined that pushes things forward in my, in my world. <laughs> what, what inspires me a lot is, is um, you know, we, we talk about many cities in the world like Tokyo, Montreal, you know, all this traveling is actually inspiring. Um, and and it's, uh, it's a privilege to be able to go to the other side of the world and see something else. Uh, in two weeks, we will do a project in, in Mongolia, for example, in the Gobi Desert. Um, so this privilege of seeing this other side gives also for myself a responsibility that I want to show to my community what I saw over there. Um, and to build this relationship between, uh, between the uh, artist and, and the public. Um, second is that uh, uh, there's of course beauty in art and aesthetics uh, that's very pleasant, uh, that motivates and that inspires me also. But in relation to technology and innovation, uh, I see actually a lot of innovation happening in the artistic research and in, in the, the creative research. Because, uh, uh, you know, a scientific lab is a very controlled environment and they want to exclude everything what is uncontrolled to find the result. A creative lab is the other way around. It's a complete chaos 
where you don't know where you will go, and, and this gives a much more open mind. So the artistic process, the creative process, is something that inspires me a lot. And I said it also in, in, in the context of education. I think education is very poor in, in that sense. Um, and that's why I, I work in art, to also show these beautiful innovations, uh, but also sometimes ugly reflections. That's also art. Um, so it brings together a lot of things that I'm very pleased and very honored and uh, that I'm able to make selections and show it to the public. So uh, what inspires me is uh, actually uh, I think that I like to make people and see people free and happy. And this is what's happening <laughs> when I do my work. It's like uh, the creativity which is expressed, that is making basically uh, someone free and happy. And uh, in case when you're running the festival, I think uh, in particular moments you have uh, absolutely enormous uh, explosion of this <laughs> expression. And this is really great. And also uh, what inspires me is that uh, in some particular moments you could feel like the world so giant, huge, you know, like everything is on a large scale. But at the same time, when we are like uh, daily communicating and being like very closely connecting, elaborating projects that are then represented uh, around the world. It makes the world uh, actually very tiny but cozy and, you know, very good to live at. So this is what inspires me. Thank you. Hi, I would like to ask you, to all of you, a question about community. Uh, does it puts forward creators or the creators put forward uh, their ideas and then form the community around the festivals? What is the inspiration for the content you bring? Um, I'm digesting your question a little bit. <laughs> um, so you, you're asking how we relate the artist to the community? Yeah. Well, kind of. Uh, do you build? Uh, the, do you bring these ideas from artists to community and uh, uh, bring all these people to festivals because they are interested in um, modern uh, arts, or uh, uh, you just feel the demand from people that need uh, um, some creative things? They are looking for it, and then you bring that content uh, that they need. Well, I, I can tell you my very personal story how how I got into this mess. Um, I, I was doing a business uh, uh, school study and, and uh, I was that close to have a corporate career. Uh, I made my start in there, but my, my mother took me to a, a performance of the Netherlands Dance Theater, NDT, uh, which uh, is, is a con contemporary dance, modern dance. And actually I, th I saw everything coming together there. The, the music, the, w the, the music was by Ryoji Ikeda, very abstract, the, the stage design, the scenography, the way they were dancing. But everyone in the room was 75 plus. And I was like, okay, there is, there is a problem in culture. Uh, maybe that's also part of our education. Uh, so that, in, that was really a motivation to, to try to bring this to my community. Uh, and back then, I had my hair here shaved. I was a gabber in Rotterdam, uh, but I also liked this this uh, this very beautiful uh, uh, performance where everything came together. Uh, and then a couple years later, you continue to build. You bring adventurous and new projects to your community. Uh, but this community is changing. We are now doing our 15th anniversary, and the the, the people who came to the first edition. Uh, have now kids and they don't, maybe they come for one night. There is a new audience that is very eager to find out. And, and what you see that this new audience also, um, we have to, to, to think for them and, and we have to also understand them because um, it, it doesn't make sense if there is a big distance between the two. Actually, what, what we are doing as, as programmers and as festival organizers is to try to, to bring this art, artistic idea close to the, the public and to erase a bit this line between the two. So from, from our very speci uh, Japan specific uh, experience is that 
like th there are so many communities out there already like and there's so many artists in like so many communities that have like their friends in japan it's like uh very very extreme because you have communities of 50 people they always meet in the same place they listen to the same friends and the same artists perform and what we really try to do with the festival is to kind of pick out these small communities pick out the artists because they already come with their communities but get them out of the comfort zone and put them into like a context that is not like the community at all. But the community will still come and then the other artist community will still come and they will start interacting and all of a sudden there's a new community happening and this is kind of like a snowball effect. The more you do that, the more that starts to happen and the more these communities start to, to intertwine and that's also why uh, for me, these new geographies are very important because I think this can, this can work like on a global scale where you have the snowball effect by just putting people and like small communities in contexts where like n like the traditional environment would never put them because it would be too risky or too experimental or something but i think that's really where the magic happens and that's uh, what we're trying to do with the festival and i think that's what gamma is also trying to do and that's what today's art has been doing for 15 years uh, it's also you you were saying it before like what 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 connects us we all have our differences uh, but what connects us is the club culture and, and the club culture is a very strong community worldwide. Doesn't matter. Even in, uh, I've been to a party in Saudi Arabia. It was insane. You have no idea. But there is an underground, even in very suppressed uh, areas. And, and I think this club culture, which is about gathering, which is about um, uh, uh, it doesn't matter where you're from, what you, what you wear, who, who you are, what gender uh, or what non-gender, whatever. Uh, it's a place where people gather and it's, it's something social and there's a cultural content on top of it. Thank you. So basically the social media is also the strong uh, tool for gathering people, right? Uh, yeah, social media is... A, the, 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 I was uh, at an opening of an exhibition uh, a week ago and, and the person was uh, explaining in his speech, he said how important it is, how, how important social media is for artists right now. Uh, and this was a multi-sensory kind of exhibition, so it was about smell and touch and, and, and these kind of things. And he, he ended his speech, he said, luckily we cannot smell social media yet. Um, uh, you know, it, it's a new way of communicating, and, and that is this new generation that is born with it, is used to it. And, and you know, we are doing this all the time, that's, that's the new form of slavery for this corporation. Every time we do this, they make money. Um, we, we are very hooked on this and it's, it's a new, new form. It's all related to this World Wide Web. Thank you. Um, so I would like to thank you, all of you, for this lecture. It was quite mind-blowing what art is now. So I want to ask you a question of, you know, you all were speaking of art just as of art. Like, okay, it's changing, but maybe it can be now more integrated into our urban space. Like, um, as I understood that art is just changing. And so do you have vision of how can, how can it be, like, maybe just put into our city spaces? Maybe, like, parks can be more, like, sound? <laughs> I don't know. Um, maybe this art can be more like our everyday life because for now art is some distinct yes so <laughs> i think you get i the think idea. it's more part of your everyday life than than you think uh, i think you're putting art already in in some kind of box uh, but uh, when people when a person chooses his car or, or his clothes that's also designed that's also a creative process uh, art as, as a very strict form is, is maybe this box. Um, uh, this is a question to Natalia. Uh, what is your opinion about graffiti culture, street art culture, and what do you think? Uh, is it a uh, new form in Russia? or it is in the past and... Uh in the uh, program that was called Artification with the Street Artists Heavily and uh, as soon as we have 
in St. Petersburg, one of the main venues, which is a factory. Uh, it's a huge uh, space, uh, Stepan Razin's factory, that uh, was abandoned and uh, actually operates just for the festival as the festival space. And uh, uh, during uh, several editions of the festival, we were inviting uh, street artists to work for the festival and for the uh, spaces in that factory, basically for the stages, so to represent the art uh, in the space where we run the festival. And uh, um, I'd say that we still continue to look for that. There is no any special open call or special program, but uh, personally me, I'm searching for like new ways to try to uh, invite those people and make it happen and be together with uh, uh, like new media artists working for the festival. Uh, actually, uh, like next week, we'll be meeting uh, people in uh, Japan, uh, also the Biction group, uh, the group of uh, Japanese graffiti artists that are working with the, um, I don't know, like the spaces in the very center, actually, of Tokyo, which are not abandoned, like it operates as the uh, retail space, like a shop. But uh, the graffiti artists, they do lots of uh, action there. And we were thinking about inviting some of the people from the group to have uh, separate like a live stage with live painting and the music that inspires the, those people, what would be very interesting to have. And of course, if this initiative would uh, happen, then we would invite Russian street artists to collaborate. So please uh, keep in touch. And uh, it's not like uh, moving to the uh, field of uh, new media art and more focusing on that. We are forgetting people who are working with us for like many editions already. So we are looking forward. Yeah. Yes, Lisha, yes. Are there any other questions? Good evening, everyone. Um, I have a personal question for Olaf. Uh, I just want to clarify about your platform that you call Today's Art. What was your motivation to create this platform? Was it something just for entertainment or for mass culture? Or you saw something deep which has some philosophy, I would say, for something enlightenment? Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, for, for sure not entertainment until the day of today. Uh, I think entertainment is something very different and I, I'm not really good at, at that. Um, I think you asked me a bit the motivation, how it started and, and how I got to, to this name. Uh, I, I, like I, I said already, first was I saw a new art form coming, driven by technology and new tools that I could not see in traditional cultural institutions yet. Uh, this was one thing. Um, in the traditional culture, which has contemporary aspects as well, I saw that there was not a, a, an, or an audience that I thought that would also be interested in this. Um, so that was the second problem. Third problem was very locally the city I live in. It's, uh, it's The Hague, it's not Amsterdam. Uh, everyone knows Amsterdam, uh, and, and the only thing we know about The Hague is the International Criminal Court. Uh, not very sexy. Um, so the, the young people in The Hague, they would, they would go in the weekend to Amsterdam or to Rotterdam. Um, and uh, at the same time, there was a very strong underground in the city, which also were never performing in that city. Uh, a strong academy with the Department for Art Science, with students from all over the world. As soon as they graduated, they left. So this was the third aspect that I was like, okay, let's build an anchor here. Let's invite the local artists, this local underground, to show what they're doing compared to the international top that joins. And we show this new art form. And uh, what's interesting, in The Hague, there was a, f a famous jazz festival, uh, Nosy Jazz. And after 25 years, it left from The Hague to Rotterdam. Uh, the two cities got a bit in a fight because these festivals uh, 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 get a lot of economic spin-off. Um, the city of The Hague did a pitch and I think 50 plans came in 
49 of them were for a new jazz festival. And I was like, no, there, there is already, the jazz festivals are already there. We want to show something new. So the things that I discovered, uh, also by going deeper and deeper into it, I got more and more eager to show this to, to an audience. Uh, and to the point of entertainment, um, uh, you, we need this audience at some point because we want to communicate. Uh, otherwise, it would be just for three people and live streamed. And you know, the, the social aspect is also um, uh, important. But compared to festivals like Sonar with 120,000 people, uh, we are very small. Um, um, uh, but but uh, this gives us also the possibility to be more cutting edge. Uh, we can also show things that are not ready yet or try out or take more risks. We are actually quite known for taking risks as a festival and doing, doing quite some crazy projects. Um, yeah, so it's, it's deeply motivated in there. And the name today's art was this new art form. I wanted to frame it. And, and media art was a, a term that started to come, but I, I, I thought it was a very stupid name. Uh, I also didn't want to have the, um, uh, the feeling that we're looking into the future or into tomorrow. I, I don't know what is tomorrow. I just know what is today with all the history that we are having there. So that's how the, the name came. Um, um, yeah, it, it's quite uh, uh, down to earth and, 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 and deep in a philosophy of why we want to show. Um, but we are a non-profit organization, so the large numbers of visitors is super nice to have, but it's not our main focus. Okay, so uh, maybe one more question. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry, that was um, a cola bottle. Um, yeah, I'm not an alcoholic. Um, all right. <laughs> so my question is, um, maybe I was not exposed to enough new art forms to um, like sense uh, the subtle ideas behind it. But um, I guess with classical art, uh, they usually address a variety of topics like human psychology, love, hatred, emotions, that kind of thing. And the general sentiment from the new art forms that I seem to be getting is more like, wow, I didn't know that was possible. Well, now I know that. Thanks, that was interesting. But like, so what? Does that seem to be a general vibe in the community? Or, or maybe it just takes more um, exposure to those kind of art forms to try to get more out of it than just like wow um i would uh, i would like to uh pick it up because uh uh i think that uh, uh this is very important so that we're talking not about just the uh culture and art forms that are changing but actually about the role of artist that is changing and uh this is uh, very much reflected in the art what we are working with so uh, we actually comparing to um, traditional art forms, um, keeping in mind that this art, uh, the, the artist role is changing, giving uh, a lot of space to different uh, critical uh, approaches to uh, contemporary art and technology. You know, so uh, this uh, is basically, I think, is very much possible in these new art forms. So to critically approach the contemporary development of the uh, society overall with the same means, uh, such as technology and science, uh, with what the uh, society, uh, government and the institutions are changing it, you know. So it's like you're taking the same uh, tool and you're showing uh, what kind of happen with it if you um, use it a bit differently. That it is uh, supposed to use. So this is where we are. I think the, the same discussion emerged when modern art came. Um, um, uh, but you, you have to expose yourself uh, a lot more, and then you will see the nuances. Because there is a lot of philosophy, there is a lot of poetry, there is a lot of beauty, there is a lot of historic context. Actually, most of the artists are reflecting on their society now. So the, all this technology, they want to do something with it. They are researching, what can I do? There is a big wow effect, look, it's interactive, but uh, it, not always. Like, like I said, sometimes there are artworks that are very painful or, or very uh, uh, powerful. 
but, but think of this. Um, classical music, a philharmonic orchestra, 25 violins, they're all doing this, they're practicing day in, day out. That's not very creative. That's just repeating what the composer wrote 100 years ago. That was the artist. They are like footballers. Sorry. I mean, I like the two were saying before, I think it's very much a representation of um, the conversations that, um, that we should be having as a society as a whole. So when Guy Benari takes us his cells and builds like a neural synthesizer, it's not about, oh wow, he can do that, but it's more about how, how this, this can be the future. Like how, how are we going to, to, to deal with this as, as human beings if we, we think about that in the future we can th uh, print uh, 3D hearts or we can 3D print, I don't know, babies or something. How, how are we dealing with these questions? And I think in this sense, um, artists working with this new technology actually have a very, very important role because um, they, they can even see things that we don't even see yet. So maybe right now it seems like very far away, why would you do that? But it's actually just like looking into the future and asking questions that uh, we should be asking now because a lot of times scientists don't ask those questions. They just develop and they don't even know if they should develop and they just see what they can do. But actually the artists are the ones who are interpreting what, what it means that we have these new technologies. So I think... I think you have a very good point there that actually science alone is very dangerous. Yeah. Uh, um, art or creativity or, or big, big broader culture, let's say, is giving value to this science. Like the ethic part. Um, and and um, I think, um, again, back to education, I think kids should go to art school now instead of going to learn economics or these kind of things. Because we need these ideas to create a better world. And if this better world will come, we have machines that will do the work, so we will have a lot of time. And let's use this time with our beautiful creativity that we have as humans to create a lot of very beautiful things. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much.